just gonna we're just gonna wait for Jamie to give us the cue. Okay, I think we are now live uh, on Facebook. Uh, so, listen, thank you uh, to the three of you for joining me tonight. Uh, for those watching on Facebook, either live or who may be watching it later, I'm James Maloney. I'm the member of Parliament for Etobicoke Lakeshore, and um, this is tonight. I am uh, doing most recent of uh, a number of Zoom slash Facebook discussions I've been doing during COVID, and tonight is a particularly uh, important one uh, for reasons which uh, will become more obvious as the evening moves along. Um, look, I'm thrilled to be joined by uh, uh, three very interesting, capable, qualified, uh, and exciting people, and I'll I'll start with. Uh, we're here to talk about. The genesis of this was we're here to talk about uh, a movie, We Were Children, which was made in 2012. And we're all uh, all too familiar with um, events that have become uh, uh, more aware to people recently than they have in the past. And I hesitated because they're not recent events. These are historical events. Uh, and it's a part of uh, Canada's tragic history that's only uh, really, really coming to light in a larger way in the last uh, months and years. And um, uh, that perhaps is a positive thing because more people are aware of it means more people want to do something to attempt to correct those wrongs. We're all familiar with the uh, horrific discovery in Kamloops a few months ago uh, of the unmarked graves and then subsequently another discovery in uh, Saskatchewan. Those aren't the last that uh, are going to be uncovered and um it's a it's a tragedy beyond description um in 2012 this film we were children was the canadian made documentary uh depicting the story of two survivors of residential schools and we're joined tonight by uh tim walkachuk who was the director of that film and full disclosure to everybody's listening tim and i have been close friends for going on 40 years now and um i remember when you were making this film tim uh, you know, the passion that you displayed and the enthusiasm like it, it was, uh, it was inspiring then and it's even more inspiring now because, as I said, that the relevance and the importance of this movie is, um, is greater than it than it's ever been. Um, Tim's a, an award winning director, producer, screenwriter, he's got uh, a list of accomplishments that are too long to discuss tonight suffice it to say, he's really good at what he does. And I'm really lucky that he's here tonight, and I'm grateful to have him as a dear friend as well. We're also joined by Lisa Meaches, who I'm very excited. Lisa and I, you and I have not met before tonight. Uh, you are one of the founders of Eagle Vision, which has uh, been around for two decades now. It's a uh, Indigenous-owned uh, um, production company. Uh, looking, If you look at the Eagle Vision's website, some of the uh, productions are... Academy Award winning, literally. I mean, Capote, I didn't, I didn't know that until today, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, the work you've done is remarkable. Uh, you're a recipient of the Order of Canada. You're a recipient of the Order of Manitoba. Uh, speaking of long list of accomplishments that are too long to talk about, I, again, we'd be here all night if I did that. But I'm really, really thrilled that you're here tonight uh, to talk to us about this. And the third member of uh, the group tonight is Pam Damoff, who is... Uh, also a dear friend, Pam was elected as a member of parliament in, in uh, Oakville in 2015 at the same time that I had the good fortune to be elected in Tobacco Lakeshore. We've uh, been on committees together and we've been uh, seat mates in the House of Commons. And um, Pam now is the parliamentary secretary to Minister Mark Miller, who's the Minister of Indigenous Services. And she knows... Uh, um, these issues firsthand. She's working them on them every day with Minister Miller, and uh, she brings a level of passion to that job that is uh, inspiring, to say the least, too. So, Pam, I'm I'm thrilled you're here. And so, before we get into the to the to the film itself, we were children. So, as I said, it was made in 2012. Again, to be candid, uh, I first became aware of it because of my friendship with Tim. You watch the film, and you 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 it creates a level of an awareness. I mean, and learning about this his, the history and the tragedy, uh, it's done by communicating the message. And this film does an incredibly good job of communicating that message. 
and it hasn't lost its power because if anything, I, I watched it when it first came out. I watched it again a couple of weeks ago and it's, it's more powerful now and more meaningful now because people have a more expanded awareness of, of some of these, some of these issues. Now, um, when I first was elected in 2015, uh, one of the first, not one of the first one-on-one -on -one meeting I had with our prime minister, who was very passionate about uh, a relationship with our First Nations community, um, I gave him a copy of this film, and uh, he was thrilled to receive it. And I look, I, it was a, an honor for me to give it to him, and I, and I did it because I know how important it was, and I know the significance of it, and I knew he would enjoy it. And then in 2016, as I said, I'm sitting with Pam in the House of Commons. She, she stands up one day and starts talking about an event she had just hosted in her constituency in, in, in Oakville, and they had shown we were children. And I said, I sort of paid close attention. I tapped her on the shoulder. I said, I know the guy that directed that film. He's a, he's a dear friend of mine. So this thing has come full circle. So when I decided to host this discussion tonight, I first reached out to Tim. Tim suggested and reached out to, to Lisa, and I'm thrilled that you were able to join it. And then I was subsequently meeting with Pam about something else, and I asked her to join. So here we are uh, talk, talking about a topic that is foremost on Canadians' minds. Um, it's, it's, uh, I'm not capable of even describing, you know, uh, how awful it is. And, but I want to talk to the three of you and really Tim and Lisa, I mean, you made this movie in 2012. So I had in 2012, the level of awareness of the residential schools was a, you know, a fraction of what it is now. So you were ahead of your time. So I want to know, and I think people want to know more about sort of the uh, the genesis of the film, how you two came to work together, uh, you know, what what inspired you to to make the film at that time, and and just generally the background. So I don't know if Lisa or Tim. And well, I, I'll jump in before Lisa, even though this is you know that film was Lisa's the brainchild, and and really her you know her passion, she was the one that came up with the entire idea. But I think it's interesting um, from my point of view that Lisa approached me and some uh, folks at uh, Entertainment One and, and through Eagle Vision, uh, I met with Lisa. And uh, I think like so many people in the audience, I was thinking, you know, when you were saying a lot of people are not always aware of, of what happened in our past. And so many people say to me after they saw the film, I had no idea. And, and that encompasses a lot of different ideas and notions and, and parts of our history. And, and the reason I wanted to jump in here before Lisa is because I felt the same way when Lisa approached me. I had no idea. I knew a little bit about Indian residential schools uh, and I really um, you know, did a lot of research and read a lot of books and spent a lot of time with Lisa and, and gradually became aware uh, you know, I was a guy that went to a, a Catholic high school, had a Catholic upbringing, went to university, and was never really properly exposed to this story, other than little tidbits that I might have heard, you know, very infrequently on the news or, or, or in conversation. But really was, uh, you know, I, I'm embarrassed to say, not really, was not even marginally aware of this story. And, and so I'll pass the buck to, to Lisa in terms of why she wanted to make the film, uh, because you know, again, it, it it really started with Lisa, and and I just became a part of it, along with so many other people, I must say. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, it, it was it was um, with I have several allies in this industry. They happen to be pretty seasoned allies. One of them happens to be Laszlo Barna as his younger sister in kinship law, you have to see the vision through, even if it's not in this, in his case, it wasn't his vision, but he was happy to help me as an ally. So I thought to myself, who better than someone with a shared history to tell this story? Because as we know, he's, he's Jewish. And he shared one of his first documentaries with the NFB was about um, that, that perspective because his, his mom survived Auschwitz. So my brother, Laszlo, took it upon himself to ask me to bring a pipe with me to, this, to sign this covenant that we would work together 
We didn't sign anything. We just smoked and, and ate together. That was deal enough for us. When you do work like that, you have to complete it. So here I am traveling across the country already for um, a federal uh, commitment. We then find that this is bigger than us. So we take the work that we, we developed and we developed a four part series called White Buffalo, which I thought was gonna be born before we were children. So it's still up for option. <laughs> um, but I will say this, that I've always been arm's length as a director producer from my, you have to, if you don't wanna get sucked in, into the vortex of, of what this has all caused, what the Indian Act, the wrath of the Indian Act has caused. Residential school and the fact that we couldn't take care of our own children as mothers, as fathers, that was only one of the assimilation policies that we're aware of. There's others that complement the annihilation on, on families. This was just one of them. So as a young filmmaker, I didn't even know that. I had no idea that my older siblings went and my dad became a police officer. He also went to residential school. He went to the first, the Brandon Residential School where I shot my first documentary for my series, The Sharing Circle, which went on for nearly 18 years in prime time. So I learned to brainwash myself CRTC rules and regulation and criteria because I was a hired gun for many uh, broadcast licenses when they were called out. So I knew what I was doing and I knew how to position myself. The reason why I hired a white guy is because I knew no one would believe me. Because the NFB asked me at that time, do you want to direct this? I said, why would I want to shoot myself in the foot when nobody believes me anyway? So I hire my, my favorite white guy who I've been, you know, at this point in my career, you like, have you seen Tim's work in his reenactments? They're yeah. spectacular. If anything that I can give my people is the truth and accuracy. His reenactments won my heart in Jonestown. When you yeah. drink Kool-Aid, when you drink Kool-Aid as Canadians, whether you're treaty or not, the bottom line is we're all gonna die if the truth isn't told. Why not hire the best? Because my people deserve nothing but the best. Now you listen to the audio, we gave them nothing but the best in audio, delivery and story, delivery clearly in director and in, in the director's chair and perhaps the producer's chair but I made sure every step of the way we hired and trained our own people and shadow so Tim was shadowed by a young pre man they work mm -hmm. side by side so in my on my films I create what's called um, a Sundance worldview we have a sacred ceremony called a Sundance for every key position four people are trained whether they're non-Indigenous or not. So I train on my shows accordingly. What happens when, when Tim directs a scene, it's magical. Something happens. Now, this wasn't easy for Tim by any stretch of the imagination. He didn't just walk in and, and it was a done deal. He had to earn the right to tell that story. So we shocked him into it. We barely told him anything. He sat down for 10 days of interviews. He didn't know if he can continue. Truth be told, I was worried I was going to lose my director. We have to have a plan B. Real. You know, yeah. just in case that our non-Indigenous crew couldn't handle. Because as you know, Tim, you saw our crew running out crying. Oh, there, it was the most intense uh, period of interviews that I've ever conducted in my life. And, uh, and these people were so open and uh, sharing. And it was, um, it, 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 it was the most incredible, uh, powerful experience just conducting those interviews. And yeah, there was people on the crew that would emotionally break down uh, during their testimony. And, um, it, it, and, and I think, that boiled down into the film, I hope, in terms of the honest honesty and yeah. the truth uh, and the sharing that those people uh, gave. You know, yeah. and we ended up with two people, Len and Lina's story, but we felt like that was emblematic 
of the tens of thousands of of young children who who went to these schools and suffered these uh, the emotional and the physical and the uh, and the sexual and psychological abuse. Was that now, re- was that reaction? If I can ask, is that because some of the crew members they weren't familiar with this history and this story either, so they're hearing and seeing this for the first time. Now you got to keep in mind that there's nothing better than shock value. I wanted to shock this man. If he wanted to know the truth, he was going to get the truth. I prayed for the, I'm a turtle clan. I'm a truth teller. He wanted to know the truth. I told him the truth. Now do you believe me, Canada? You didn't believe me 10 years ago when I told you they're going to find graves and babies and walls. There are others. Now, Lina and Glenn's story on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst of abuses, they were maybe a two or three, maybe. We heard tens. There are people walking out there like zombies with no souls because of what happened in these schools. As a result, now you got to keep in mind, this is over five generations. This didn't, and now the intergenerational impacts. You see it everywhere. You don't, you, my reserve right now in the, in the drought in Manitoba, there's no running water on the reserve. I live off reserve. I bought my land off reserve. Now, the reserve folks don't have running water, but you can get meth and cocaine anywhere on the res. Why is that? So to me, there's still much more work to be done. So I want to challenge the audience. I want to challenge our our allies here on this panel, we are just beginning. Now, we're not gonna play blame game. That's not gonna get us anywhere. We want believers and allies. For me as a filmmaker, this wasn't about tarring and feathering anybody. There were good people that were teachers in those institutions. There were good clergy people, both men and women. These kids, Taught, were taught survival skills. Their parents weren't allowed to keep them. Stony Mountain Penitentiary was built for dissident parents. How is that that nobody knows the story? Now, We Were Children is just scratching the surface. I guarantee with all these young filmmakers sprouting out these truth tellers, you I, know, we got, we gonna, got to meet them halfway. Look, I, I, look I'm glad you're... I, I, I could sit here and talk about this all night. I mean, what you're saying is is absolutely right. But I'm, I'm going to bring Pam in here for two things. I want to talk about, A, sort of the, the, the challenge you've just talked about, because uh, Pam and I and all of our colleagues uh, in the government, we, we, we accept that challenge. We're, and I'd be curious to go back to you in a moment, Lisa, to hear your to views on how you think things are being handled and, and progressing now, but I will be the first to admit that as a government, we don't always get things right, but you're not going to fail if you don't try either, right? And I think that I'm comfortable in saying that our government uh, has certainly uh, made great strides and, it's, and it's, it's tried a great deal to try to address some of these issues and Pam's been a big part of that. So, and you know, the, the, this, this movie, is a big part, I suspect, of uh, Pam's uh, mindset too. I mean, it was, uh, as she said, she inspired her, inspired her so much that she shared it with uh, some of her own community members. So, Pam, I mean, you can you can talk about um, things that are happening right now with our with the government and uh, over the past uh, months and few years, actually days for that matter. Well, thanks, James and and Lisa and Tim. My goodness, this is uh, it's such an honor to join both of you and uh, to meet both of you. Um, Lisa, if we were in person, I would offer you a gift of tobacco. Thank you for for joining us. Um, And I'm I'm joining you today from Halton Region and uh, Halton Region is is uh, rich in history and modern traditions of many First Nations in the Métis. From the Anishinaabe to the Attawandran, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in Indigenous history. So as we gather together on these treaty lands, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing their traditional territory with me here in my riding. 
I have to tell you that when we screened the documentary, um, afterwards I had a panel with three, uh, three Indigenous people from my community. And when I first got up there, I actually couldn't speak. I was, I was so emotional and James knows I'm, I'm emotional at the best of times, but that night I could not find the words. Um, as I looked at, at my three friends and thought, um, if I had been born in a different situation, I could have been in, in exactly the same situation. If I had been born on a reserve to, to an indigenous family, my life would have been very different. And, and um, we had a former member of parliament in the audience. He served in the early 1980s. He lives in my riding now. And during the Q and A afterwards, he said to me, I wish I had known what I learned in that movie. I never knew that when I served in parliament. So it was, it was really quite something. And then I had a, a lady who uh, immigrated to Canada and she said, why didn't I learn this when I took my citizenship test? And, you know, it, so it had an incredibly, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you don't hear every time this film is, is, um, is, is screened anywhere. Um, when, when, um, when the bodies were, were, uh, discovered at, um, um, oh, my mind's gone blank. Kamloops. 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 Um, I reached out to our colleague, Michael McLeod, who is from Northwest Territories to see if he was okay. And he said, Pam, Indigenous peoples knew, knew about all of this. It's you that didn't know about it. Oh. And in his community, um, he, is, he went to residential school. We're the same age. Um, he said in his community, uh, there had been a um, graveyard and the Catholic church had taken down all of the gravestones, plowed it over and grew potatoes there. And so years later, the community built a memorial to uh, the people who had been buried in this field. But I think it, it's been a, a discovery for um, non-Indigenous peoples. But Lisa, as you were saying, you, want, you worked with Tim because you wanted the people to believe you. I think, um, you know, for us, it was a shock. Uh, for others, the, the whole experience of residential schools is something that you and your families have, have grown up with. So um, certainly there's, there's a few things I wanted to mention. A few weeks ago, I was at Mohawk Institute in Brantford. Um, it's one of the oldest and was one of the largest residential schools. It operated from, I think it was 1830 to 1970. They only have recorded 52 deaths at that school. I mean, even in 1830, if you weren't in a residential school, people died and at greater numbers. They only recorded 52 deaths at that school. They had six survivors that were there. Uh, so the federal government is investing $7.6 million and the province is putting in the balance to give them almost $10 million to restore the, the, the institute, which is what the community wants to do. And I think that's really important because what we want to do as a federal government is take the lead from survivors. We shouldn't be determining whether an institute is preserved, whether it's torn down, whether a community looks to see if there are, are bodies there or whether they don't. It needs to be driven by the First Nations themselves. Um, and yesterday, uh, you may have seen that there was an announcement made um, so that we can support uh, First Nations who want to locate burial sites, who want to commemorate and memorialize these innocent lives that have been lost. So we, they, we announced $320 million in additional support um, that will be survivor centric and culturally informed. And there's a number of components to it. The, the part that I, I, I'm most pleased about because at Indigenous Service we pushed for this was mental health supports for survivors and for communities. So there's an additional $100.1 million to support the work. Um, sorry, that's the wrong number, $107 million. I've got this stuff written down here so that I get all the numbers right. Um, to, expo to, to enhance the mental health 
uh, supports that are being provided. There's also going to be $83 million to supplement um, uh, research and locate burial sites if that's what the community wants to do and to commemorate and mem memorialize it. Um, that we'll be establishing a national advisory committee to advise communi communities First Nations and the Government of Canada on how best to do this work. And then $100 million if, built, if, if First Nations want to restore, demolish, rehabilitate, whatever it is that they wish to do, um, there's funding for that as well. And the Minister of Justice, David Lametti, um, announced that we are going to um, select a special interlocutor who will work with Indigenous peoples, provinces, territories, and First Nations to identify the measures and make recommendations regarding any changes we need to laws, regulations, policies, practices around unmarked and undocumented graves and burial sites. So that's a, a quick summary of some of the, the announcement that was made yesterday. But um, Lisa, I'm curious, you mentioned that your, com your uh, community still has a long-term drinking water advisory in Man Manitoba. There are still two. Um, no, there's, it, it, no, I, I, I um, what I stated was that uh, it, because of the drought. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I misunderstood you. Yeah. I misunderstood it was, you. It's because of the drought, Pam. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's great, Pam. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to go back to, to you for a second, Tim, and something Lisa said. So she talked about, and I know what she's talking about when she says she wanted to get the right guy, because I said, I've known Tim for a long time, all these projects, like sitting and talking to Tim about project, whatever project he's working on, you just, you feel inspired. And the, the, the things you learn from talking to Tim are never cease to amaze me. And there's this project more so than any other he'd worked on. Um, but the, the shock value that Lisa was talking about, you know, it's sort of the getting you ready to do this. Tell us what sort of impact that had on you and, and well, you know, what it was like going through that. Yeah, uh, thanks, James. And, and Pam, that was amazing. Uh, that was great to hear, um, by the way. Uh, it, it was um, <laughs> very much so uh, an education for me that was, uh, you know, what books should I read? Which people should I talk to? Lisa was my guide. Um, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Kyle Irving, who was, uh, you know, uh, a brother on this project and, and a partner of Lisa's. And he was an amazing contributor and, and very passionate about the entire project. I spent personally five years of my life on and off working on this project. And as a freelancer uh, who produces and or directs, primarily directs, um, generally you get blocked into a commitment where it's like, you know, we need you for six months for a project or a year. Um, and I would, anytime I got hired over that five-year period, uh, say, hey, I'm working on this project and I need to know if you guys will let me go for six weeks or eight weeks during a period of time in the middle of production to go back to this other project that I was so heavily invested in. And, and so I spent five years of my life working on that from start to finish. Lisa and Kyle, seven years. Um, and so, so the arc of my own personal education was, was really, um, you know, significant. It's marked me to this day. I mean, I, I read an article about anything to do with uh, indig Indigenous people, uh, you know, what's going on out there. And um, I can't help but being attracted to it it's uh, you know after spending that amount of time and uh and learning about it you you become um you know i guess in essence a different person it, it, it marks it shapes you and so we're, I, we're, we're a pretty important. contagious we're a pretty contagious community <laughs> i'll say <laughs> <laughs> that's a good that's a good thing yeah, that is a good, good thing because good if thing. you want if you want to know the truth of what really happened you don't have to look far if they were your children, what would you do if you saw young people suffering and crying or women, you know, raising? Like there's so many things that attribute to the, the world we live in now, which I call ground zero. Nothing has changed since this film. Now, um, you mentioned, Pam, all this money being allocated. Now, 
I was given a license to start the interviews from uh, NFB. One film changed the world. Can you imagine if I had money to train 50 young filmmakers about this subject matter and they do it in song form and beating and, and, and star blanket tables and do, you know, everybody throws money at the leadership. Sure, they're, they do their thing. What about the arts and culture sector? It was completely overlooked at the TRC and I love Justice Sinclair. I worked for the TRC for two years and produced their national events for them. You mentioned our film several, several times in the document. Yeah, and so, of course, when I see arts and culture saving lives and people call me, all young, my young people call me, I, I have a film program with the National Screen Institute, over 150 young people, indigenous people graduated from my program. I'm now co-producing with my own students. So these young people, have a story to tell, have a song in their heart, have a dance to dance. They're hungry for culture and they won't be getting it from video games. And you they know what? Can't. The only way we'll change the, the, the content in at the CBC or films that are made is by those young people learning from you, Lisa, and going out and producing their own productions. And I, I mean, we have been investing in the languages for sure. Um, Mark Miller took Mohawk lessons down at Six Nations. Before he was minister and I was parliamentary secretary during one of January, we went down so that he could meet the uh, language teachers. And we, you know, spent some time at the language school. And it, we have put funding into the language side. The arts, I'm not as sure so I don't right. want to say yes I don't yeah, want right. to say no otherwise um, you would have been able to state it in bullet point but you know what that's, it would be funded through us good. though it would be funded through heritage not indigenous yeah. services so that's why I, I mean I don't know for sure Lisa but it's well, see, we gotta we gotta eliminate we gotta get these stories out while we have survivors living we can't wait we're gonna get it done with or without government help we're doing it now anyway why not join the nation that is truth-telling now, you talked about propagation and the CBC. What I presented to the CRTC about the CBC in favor of their license renewal. I kindly ask for an apology as an as a intergenerational survivor of the propagation by the CBC in the 50s and 60s that were leading, misleading communities, non-Indigenous and Indigenous people alike. Lies, feeding us lies. Someone's got to be, someone's got to atone for that. We want to talk about reconciliation. Let's talk about atonement first. Truth be told. Now, I'm not an angry person. I don't tar and feather anybody. But I have answers and best practices that I want to share. If you're in, you're in. I'm going to do them anyway. I promise you. I'm a woman of my word. Ask Tim. Ask your best friend, Tim. I'm a woman of my word. The, the survivors asked for accuracy. That's what I gave them. I put my life on that film. How did you, I, the, how did the, you the land on the, the sorry. Sorry, how, how did you land on these two stories? Good question. Um, we interviewed nearly a thousand. Like I said, wow. most were most were eight to ten on severity. The broadcaster and the investors at that time said the 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 the, the audience couldn't digest a ten, maybe a two or three. We found them a two and three. That was all, that's all we had time and money for. Now, can you imagine what more we can do? The, the, what happened in the last 10 years, uh, you know, the TRC and all these amazing projects, all these amazing efforts that opened up this can of worms. That's why we're living in ground zero because we haven't closed that scab that we picked and picked and picked Okay, so on that note, closing the scab and the, the way you've described it, I mean, that, that comes through a little bit when you're talking to the two of them during the course of the film. But there must, I mean, for every piece that was actually in the, in the documentary, there must have been uh, all well, kinds of discussion that wasn't included. This must have been incredibly hard for them. Well, yeah, if I can jump in. I mean, these people were amazing to just the 10 that we distilled down from the hundreds of interviews that Lisa had conducted on, on tape. Um, we then 
ask them to come in front of our cameras. And, and that was that incredibly, um, you know, draining process, not only for them, uh, but for the crew, because for many of them, it was the first time they had shared their stories. Uh, maybe with some of their family members. In some cases, uh, I recall them specifically saying, I've never shared this with anybody in my life. That's what I wondered, yeah. I wondered about that. And then they told their story. Um, And and then there was the whole debate about, as Lisa's already touched upon, how, how graphic do we go? You can't sugarcoat this kind of history. So, uh, you know, we wanted to be truthful and honest, but also make it so that the, the audience isn't going to walk out of the theater or turn off the television. And, and there's a very fine line to skate. And I must say, Jason Sherman, who, who wrote the screenplay, and, and when I say screenplay, I don't mean it's fictitious. He took the interviews and then wrote the scenes that they so specifically spoke about. So if they're talking about something for five minutes or 10 minutes that happened to them, maybe half an hour, that might have been boiled down into a five minute scene, but the dialogue was inspired by what they had said in the interview. I asked the priest or I said this, or I said that. Um, and and so uh, it, it was all based on their testimony. And Jason Sherman wrote a, a, an absolutely beautiful script and John Witcher, um, the editor, uh, you know, it's a collaboration anytime you make a film. So, you know, it started with Lisa and Kyle and, and David Christensen, people from the National Film Board. It, 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 started, it started with the families that agreed. Well, De- no. Glenn Anaquad gave approval to his family in the rough cut stage because he was dying. Yeah. Yeah. He said, he said to his family, make sure my truth is told. Give Lisa everything she needs. See this film through. During the rough cut stage, and he already passed, I did a private screening with his family. It was hard to watch. With that family put themselves through to carry him. So you see peaceful resolution. You see that. You see peaceful resolution. It's always the land. It's the language. It's the songs. It's not in Ottawa. It's not in Parliament. It's not. The solutions aren't that um, cut and dry. They're intangible. You can't, you can feel them because you feel its strength, but they're intangible like Wi-Fi. You know what works? How does it work? Who knows, but we pay for it. <laughs> okay. You know, I, Lisa, there, I was just thinking while you were talking about a couple of other documentaries that I know uh, one of them, um, Drew Hayden Taylor has received funding from the government of Canada to do, he did a play at the National Arts Centre and I, um, I don't remember the name of it. It was like Sir John A, Sir John A, the legend of an Ojibwe warrior or something like that. But I saw a documentary on Mary Tuax early uh, during hot docs. I didn't know who she was. And she is just one badass um, warrior. Uh, she's amazing. Do, I, do, you, do you, Tim and James, do you know who she was? I, I mean, know. you talk about feminists. Why don't Canadians know about Mary Tuax Early, who's responsible for um, Indigenous women not being re- having their status removed? And she did all this back in the in the eighties, traveling to Ottawa from from her community in Quebec, um, taking on her her own community, taking on you know Pierre Trudeau and all the politicians. It was amazing. Wow. And then there's, there was also one called We Will Stand Up about Colton Bushy, um, extremely powerful about this young man who was, um, who was killed um, by a farmer when he went on the property and uh, interviews with his family. And I mean, there's, there's so many stories out there. But, 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 but Pam, can I just throw in my two yeah. cents here? When we produced We Were Children, when I interviewed all those survivors, they didn't just have horrible stories. Those kids knew how to survive. They had the, they made the best of every situation. What you don't see are the funny stories. What yeah. you don't see is how these kids actually ate and stole. And it, to them, it was a game. And, you know, it was a regular playground. You got to remember, it was still a school. They did have fun. That's what you don't see in any of these stories. We were not a lot allowed to laugh on prime time. Indians aren't allowed to laugh on prime time television in this country, period. Well, why that's why that? that's why Drew Hayden Taylor 
um, his stories do bring that humor, right? Yeah. Um, he, it, depending on, on um, no, he hasn't had, I, I, I don't think he's had the success that he should have, um, but his, yeah. his, his stories do bring the important messages, but also bring humor to the story, right? Yeah. So I, you know what, I'm, I only have 5% on my, I've been scouting all day. We're through, I'm producing a feature of film in October uh, with another indigenous uh, director who's um, uh, flying in. She just left. Um, so I've been, I've been on the road scouting for two days with, as you know, it's part of our protocol. I love scouting. I scout like a real Indian scouts. And um, I pay for the right to, to film on these traditional territories and I ask permission from the land. So I teach anyone who's working with me how to pray from our perspective. And that's what this film was about, education, education. Did we want to tar and feather anybody? That wasn't our intention. Our intention was to fulfill the covenant that we made with Creator and those survivors. They live long enough to, to want to tell their story. As an intergenerational survivor, it was my honor and my pleasure to meet them halfway. That's the least I could have done. That's the least we all could do. So the challenge that I have for the audience or this panel, befriend your fellow indigenous people. If you can name five by name, yeah. clearly you're not doing your work. You should have plenty of friends. We're I'm a dozen on most reserves. Bottom line. We like laughing. We like la having fun. We enjoy non-Indigenous allies. I'm one of, I call Tim my brother. We're not blood related, but man, I sure do respect him. He's my brother and has my back and has my people's back. And so does Laszlo. So does all Jason Sherman, especially Kyle Irving, especially Rebecca Gibson. They're my brother and my sister. And I love them and adore them. They love me they, and they chose me and I chose them. The difference in kinship law when you're blood related is you're stuck with your blood. Kinship laws, you get to choose. And hey. so. Sorry, sorry, Lisa. No, no, go ahead. Uh, so that's why I have so many relatives, not because I want to strategize, but because it's my good intention, because I believe in natural law before CRTC rules and regulation before even man-made laws. My, I'm a woman of the law of the land. I'm a grandmother first. That's what gives me the, the right to tell stories. I've done this all my life. I've been a filmmaker. I'm, I come from nothing and humble beginnings. None of us grew up rich. I didn't have running water. Sad luck stories, hard luck stories like that. Sure, they're, they're everywhere, but we're tenacious. We're brilliant. We're funny. We're sad. Some of us are angry. But at the end of the day, we want to find the truth, just like all Canadians. Don't forget, Canadians were lied to too. Brothers and sisters, they were lied to too. It wasn't just our camp. Everybody was lied to, including you folks. On that's why you don't know anything about this, because you weren't you weren't told uh, the truth or half truths or nothing at all. But thanks, uh, James and Pam, for participating in this and you know, we're having this uh, discussion, which is great, right? That's what it's all about. Moving listen, don't, forward. listen, that's nice of you to say, but don't thank us. I mean, this, it, I, I can't say this in strong enough language. This movie is very, very powerful. And I'm going to extend an invitation here on behalf of Pam and I. Pam didn't know I was going to do this, but when <clears throat> this pandemic has uh, evolved to a point where things are such that we can get back together in large groups, I would love for the two of you to come to Ottawa and we can host a screening of this for our parliamentary colleagues and have a discussion like this with them. Because this, this, as I said at the outset, this uh, movie, this film has greater meaning and uh, impact now, perhaps than it did in 2012, only because the level of awareness has increased. Tim, you said at the beginning, you weren't aware of this. You and I are the same age. I was born in Thunder Bay. I moved to Toronto when I was 12. There was a residential school in Thunder Bay while I lived there going to school. I had no idea until yeah. I was about 35 years old. You know, so my final message before I'm on my last 3% here, I just want to remind Canadians and non-Indigenous folks, even Indigenous folks, 
Let's work together in a peaceful way. Let's find a resolution together. Let's not fight one amongst one another. Let's work with good intention and, and in good spirit. I'm of that person and the people I work with around me are of that nature as well. I run with like-minded wolves. No, and we don't stray from telling stories. It's a covenant that we make as storytellers to tell the truth, especially documentary. So I have to remain arm's length for my community. I have no choice. Now, what I'm gonna tell you is that I don't want my friends and allies, my friends on this panel to carry any guilt. It wasn't your fault, but as a change maker, as a connector, let's do this together as a cohesive community. Sure, we use the term, this is our land. It's mother earth, nobody owns her. We're all stewards of her, every single one of us. We're her water protector, every single one of us. Let's work together to get clean drinking water, arts and culture programming, music programs in schools. That's how we're gonna fix this. Not by throwing money to the same programs that continually misspend or move money around to, to pay Paul and whatever that saying goes. You know what I'm getting at. At the end of the day, the solutions are very practical. Let's ask the intergenerational survivors how they live how we survived, why we're grasping to hang on to our language. Ask us, we'll tell you. I can assemble that group across the nation. I'll bring the young people, I'll bring the elders, the ones that never get recognized. You know, it's unfortunate that it took this to bring us together as a nation, but let's use that as a jumping off point. Let's use this as a new path. This, we're all trailblazers, every single one of us. This is new for all of us. I had no idea that anybody even watched We Were Children, according to the numbers. But to hear that it still is impactful, is meaningful for me as a filmmaker and an intergenerational school survivor. My parents would be proud, my late parents. My, I shot my first documentary at that school where my dad went. I had no idea. I interviewed all his friends. I know what my dad went through. Didn't take much, I'm a smart chick. Didn't take much to put that story together. It hurts, but my dad and my mom wouldn't want me to hold on to grudges. So I forgive, I, I need to have a good sleep tonight. Tomorrow I got another project to go to. I'm harvesting on the land with my aunties and my uncles because it's harvesting season. I got to get back to the res and, you know, hopefully this gets another premiere somewhere. Maybe CBC will, will take another look at it. I don't know, but there are other stories and they're only going to get worse unless we learn to embrace them as a nation. You're going to find more stories, more deaths, more graves. You're going to find angry people, but there'll be others. There's a time for militancy then there's a time for peace. Now's the time for peace. Let's love one another. Let's rely on those natural laws to guide us out of this mess. We were all responsible as long as we choose to not live a certain way of life according to how creator understands us two-legged. We're stupid people. We know that we, the four-legged have never compromised or the wing nation have never compromised their existence to live and to live in harmony with one another. All of us, different colors, skin people, we should listen to the animals. We should listen to the trees. That's, you know, that's the reality. That's where I draw my strength from. You want to call me successful? It's not me. It's the people I surround myself with. I barely have an education and barely know I'm dyslexic. I didn't know that, but I surround myself with good allies. I'm smart that way. I should have been there when Treaty One was being negotiated. We, I'm sure we would have got a better deal. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I just want to say thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for taking it upon yourself to showcase and to promote our vision, this is not just my vision, it's the vision of every single family that has ever woken up with brown skin and felt ugly.
those days are gone. I've always believed in all my work as a filmmaker, the beauty of our people. Never compromised on that. And I still won't, but I'm gonna drag you folks kicking and screaming with me if I have to. You don't, you don't have to, we're gonna come along willingly. There is nothing I could add at this point. Uh, that is, uh, I'm going to leave it there. All I'm going to say is, Pam, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank Lisa you. and Tim, I can't possibly thank you enough for joining us tonight, but for making this film and can giving I, us the I opportunity. Just, can I just jump in and let your sure. audience, whoever's out there listening, um, that, that the film is available on Amazon Prime? If they are interested, uh, I'm sure you could. Uh, I think you can get it on Apple TV, uh, and it's out there on um, uh, iTunes as well. So, yeah. um, yeah, it, 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 I don't even know what it's on. For me, it's it's still fresh, like it just aired yesterday. Because I live in Ground Zero, so you can find it anywhere. You can watch it anywhere. You, if you if you can find um, Ice Road Truckers. If you can find the CBC News, you can find We Were yeah. Children. Yeah. Here, here. And and you should. And that's where I will leave it. You should watch. This it's is not, this is this is exactly a must the must feel watch. Good movie of the year. It's not exactly the feel good movie of the year. Take some medicine, take loved ones, talk about it, discuss it, talk to your clergy people, talk to elders, but invite a survivor to watch it with you, someone who's already healing or starting that healing process, because not all of us are. That's when anger sets in. The more respect we use as a nation, the better off we'll be in finding a solution. The scene at the beginning when young Lena gets in that truck and leaves her mother, I, I, I almost had to turn it off again. It was just, anyway. Guys, thank you. And uh, we, will, we will pick this up and we will do this in Ottawa. And I hope everybody who's watching this takes up the challenge and, and, and also watches the film because it's important. And it, uh, it means a lot. So thank you, everybody. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, James. Thanks, Tim. My, my pleasure. Thanks, Pam.